What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Circus Electrique, the sort of circus management meets darkest dungeon game that released quite recently actually. And with that, a couple of things to get out of the way up front at the beginning of the video. I did do a sponsored video for the launch of this game, but obviously the reviews themselves would never be sponsored. But nonetheless, there is that disclosure for you. And secondly, I review games after 100% all the time, primarily to set me apart from other content creators and YouTube reviewers, etc. And while that does include the achievements, it does include a lot more than that as well. And if you go to my page and you're not subscribed, first thing you'll see is a video explaining everything I cover and my Steam profile is public and linked in the description below. But with no further ado, let's actually jump into this thing. So as I mentioned, Circus Electric is a bit of circus management them, mixed with some tactical turn-based gameplay very similar to Darkest Dungeon. If you've played that game at all, you'll kind of understand the gist of what's going on here. There's definitely a lot of flavor to this game that I think makes it stand out in spite of that, but nonetheless, the comparisons to Darkest Dungeon are very obvious and worth mentioning right up front. But nonetheless, the circus part of it is kind of all-encompassing, and they really did a good job of bringing all of those elements to it, so it nonetheless feels pretty unique. Moreover, I'd tell you that this game is a bit easier than Darkest Dungeon, honestly, which is helped along by the three difficulty modes that are available to you. Pretty much the standard easy, normal, hard. And what these effects specifically are the normal stuff you'd see in just about any game, but also positive and negative effects affecting your characters based on a mechanic called devotion which we're going to get into on easy the negative stuff doesn't really proc but then on hard the negative stuff pops up more often that type of thing but nonetheless you got some options here in terms of playtime but i would tell you just across the board bit easier than darkest dungeon now let's talk about the story setup a little bit while we will be controlling all sorts of performers etc who are going to be doing combat for us technically story-wise you're playing a set character a woman whose mother died in a circus accident, actually, as she was a circus performer, which led to the shutdown of said circus. It is reopening quite soon, and you, as her daughter, are sent to interview your uncle, actually, about the reopening of the circus. However, when you go to do this, a citywide event sort of happens, and people called the Vicious start attacking everyone in an event called the Maddening, which is essentially exactly that, a bunch of people going crazy and attacking everyone and anything. This particular version of London is an alternative history version where we see a lot of steampunk technology that was spurred on by a scientific report that was delivered by one Dr. Ohm. And collectively, this report, if you will, is known as the Spark, which then led to all this steampunk technology, and it's kind of where the timeline differs. So throughout the game, what you'll be doing is essentially using circus performers to protect your main character while you go out and investigate this sort of investigative journalist style and get to the bottom of why the Vicious are attacking everyone. Now, that's as much as I'm going to tell you without spoilers, but I would tell you for a game like this, my bar for the story wasn't very high. I wasn't exactly expecting a lot, but I think they did a lot with a little. Most of the story takes place in these sort of conversations. I'm sure you've seen on screen up to this point, but these are all fully voice acted. The voice acting is quite good and the writing's pretty solid. The story's actually pretty interesting. Now, again, a game like this, I don't think the story was ever really going to blow anybody away, but I would tell you just across the board, the story is better than I expected, which I thought was nice. Now, let's actually dive into some other aspects of the game. Let's talk about your actual performers, or the people who are going to be performing combat for you, as well as performing in shows for your circus. As I talk about this particular game, it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of mechanics are interwoven together, so I might repeat a few things here and there. But nonetheless, when it comes to your performers, ultimately there are 15 classes available to you. Now, you only start out with a few of those actually available, and then as you play more of the game and progress more of the story, more and more of them will unlock. And then as you upgrade your circus, more specifically the area where you recruit these performers from, you'll also be able to unlock more and more classes here as well. But ultimately there are 15 of them. And that by itself leads to a ton of variety actually, because when you are exploring the city of London, you will be taking four performers with you at a maximum, meaning that you can create quite a bit of variety and combinations to your sort of combat team. And this leads to a lot 
of variety to the turn-based combat, which we'll get into a bit later. These performers can actually level up and do have kind of traits that are unique to them. Each class will have a set of skills that they have available to them. However, depending on the character, they'll sort of draw from that pool and get six of them. So when you recruit them from the train area of the circus, they'll have separate abilities from other members of their class even, just kind of depending on what they get luck of the draw wise. And then they'll also have a few unique abilities that are pulled from their class as well, such as some of the fire breathers, for instance, can be immune to fire, whereas some of the strong men can be unable to be moved from certain positions in the lineup, stuff like that. And then as you level these characters up, you can do two things. You can upgrade their circus stats as well as their actual skills. Skills are the stuff you're using in combat. So you'll find upgrade materials and as characters level up, you can raise their skills up to their max level. This will get you more damage and just overall make the skills better in general. Now the circus stats are especially interesting as leveling these up dictates how well they perform in your circus shows. Every time a character levels up, they get 10 points to allocate to their circus stats. They can only have a maximum in each stat, kind of depending on their class and everything, per level. So as you level up, these maximums increase. But overall, just lean into what they're good at and you're pretty much good to go. Now let's talk about the circus a little bit. Much like your performers, the circus itself will actually be leveling up as well. As you complete various events throughout the city, take part in combat, all of that stuff, you'll gain circus fame. Circus fame is how you level up your circus. Doing this gives you access to to all sorts of stuff. More tents, more buildings, more utility from those buildings. But the main thing you do at your circus is perform shows. So let's talk about that first. This is primarily done through a sort of management thing. You don't actually see the shows or anything like that. But as your circus grows, you'll get more and more of these shows available to you and you'll have to assign performers to actually performing the show. This is down to ultimately a few things. Each of your performers specializes in an act or their circus act. Really. This has an icon shown in the form of an arrow, more or less, in the performer's sort of stat card, and you'll want to match performers up to the events that they would be good at. It's a little more complicated than that, though, because each performer has chemistry, meaning that there are little icons on the right of their picture card that indicate which performers they like to work with and what type of performers they don't like to work with. So it's a bit of a balancing act between finding performers that have the type of act that you need them to have have while also being able to work with your other performers. Doing both of those things together will award you more stars. And the next page of this, the stars can be allocated to various stats that are available to each show that will increase either the circus fame gained from the show, experience gained from the show, or just money and gifts also obtained from a successful show. Each of the shows has a minimum amount of circus stats that has to be met to even perform the show though. So the circus stats I mentioned for the characters earlier are important because all of the performers in a show have to collectively meet that goal in order to be able to perform the show in the first place. Other parts of your circus are things like the recruitment train, crafting, the oracle, the training grounds, the sleeping tent, and the training tent. Some of these are self-explanatory. The train is where you bring in fresh recruits. As it levels up, you get more classes available to you, more people to recruit, higher level recruits, the standard stuff. The oracle will allow you to see more on the map and get more information about upcoming battles, etc., to plan a little better. The training grounds will let you kind of grind out combat encounters with for a little bit of resources, which can be a little helpful later, which we'll talk about. The sleeping tent is where you heal injured characters at, and the training grounds is where you can get lower level characters up to speed with the rest of your characters without having to just dismiss them and recruit someone new. As you can dismiss performers that you don't want anymore at any time, and then hire new ones provided you have the money to do so. And then there is the crafting tent. Before we dive into crafting, I want to mention that all of these various tents have resources associated with them to be used because you have to be feeding all of your performers while simultaneously upgrading all of your tents, etc. as the circus fame goes up. So there's a lot of resource management involved in this and definitely something you need to keep an eye on because the actual fail state of the game where you're going to get a game over is if you run out of resources to continue. But let's actually talk about crafting. Crafting is something, it's actually pretty integral to the game, I would say, but I didn't 
care for it as much. On one hand, it's nice. You can craft all sorts of consumables for combat, things that will help your character, you know, healing items, buffs, that type of stuff. You can also craft items that help your shows and give you free stars, for instance, instead of you having to just have perfect chemistry with your performers. And then there are special items, actually, that will let you gain entry into some clubs and stuff we'll talk about a little bit later as well. However, my main problem with this was that the resources can be a little scarce. There's a few different ways of gathering them, kind of just randomly on the map when you win fights, find loot, etc., or when you perform certain circus shows. Certain types of shows give you a higher chance at very specific gifts from the audience, which can help out here. But in general, I found it very hard to grind out specific ingredients with any sort of accuracy, which means you're kind of just taking this shotgun approach to this, which meant that I spent a lot of the later game in particular just hoping to get certain resources so I could craft certain items to be able to continue fighting and doing sort of story advancement with relative ease, which was mostly a late game issue as the early game is pretty straightforward to be honest, but there definitely came a point where I needed to craft things and I just could not get the resources for it. All of that said, let's actually talk about the combat of this game. As I mentioned, it's a turn-based tactical title. So there's going to be four members on your team and four members on the enemy team. Again, if you're familiar with Darkest Dungeon, very similar. But let's talk about the most important stuff, and that is essentially positioning and the devotion mechanic. So positioning is important as certain classes favor certain positions in your lineup. And this is because some skills can only be activated from certain positions in your lineup and will only affect certain positions of the other team's lineup. Again, most classes have a preference of where they want to be, and each individual character's sort of card will actually tell you which positions they will do their best in, which is pretty helpful. And can actually vary a little bit depending on the skills that character has, so just because they are a certain class doesn't necessarily mean they'll be good in the exact same spots as another member of that class. But the other mechanic at play here is the devotion mechanic. This is a sort of morale system and sort of overall well-being of your performance. A high devotion increases combat effectiveness a great deal by just flat out giving them more damage, more chance to hit, and a low devotion obviously negatively affects all of those things. So it's pretty important to manage your performer's devotion because if a devotion count is low and it gets taken to zero by an enemy because enemies do have moves that can affect your devotion, just as you have moves that can affect their devotion as well, but if anyone's devotion hits zero in battle, they immediately flee. It's effectively the same same as killing them. So it is something you have to watch out for. And there are builds that you can make for your performers and, again, enemies that will do the same thing, where they specifically attack your devotion. Moreover, some skills basically work off of devotion. They cost devotion to use, and then they have a higher damage effect, etc. There are a few various ways to raise this, such as winning combat, taking out enemies, performing in circus shows, assigning a character to the sleeping tent to heal. So there are ways to raise the devotion back up, of course, but it's definitely a mechanic you need to keep your eye on. Because of its sort of attachment to the circus shows, etc., devotion kind of weaves itself throughout every aspect of this game, which is a really interesting notion that I actually enjoyed quite a bit. Again, late game, there are definitely spots where it can get a little bit annoying, frankly, but for most of the game, I think it works quite well. But let's say things don't go well and you lose a battle. It's not actually Actually the end of the game. You can, of course, just reload the fight if you want to, if you want things to go a little better for you, but while any character brought to zero health will die, any character brought to zero devotion is still alive and can be saved, more or less, so you can increase their devotion again and keep using them, but characters brought to zero HP will die at the end of a battle. But if you don't want to reload, you don't have to by any means. It's not the end of the world. You can recruit more performers, etc. As long as you've got resources, you can just try that fight again. But now that we've got sort of the basics of the game covered, let's talk about the actual gameplay a little bit. So there's a day cycle to kind of everything you're doing. A typical day is going to see you managing your circus, setting up a circus show, and then going out to the exploration part of the game. You'll be exploring six districts of London overall. Each one of them serves as sort of its own act of the game, and you'll move through somewhat linear paths to an objective. And each day ends 
for the most part, when you win a fight. So there will be set encounters on these sort of linear maps, and every time you either win or lose those, really, the day switches over to the next day, which will advance time, your resources, all that stuff. Worth mentioning, mostly because some circus shows take more than one day, and will occupy your performers for more than one day. Doesn't end there, though. The districts themselves have some interesting things going on. You can run into sort of mini events. The story will actually advance a lot as you move through the districts as well, but there are also other events that will lead to sort of mini games that can give you extra rewards if you are good at them or win, and you can see extra stuff this way as well. However, you can also reset the districts after you go through them. So while you cannot freely explore any of the districts, after you complete a district, and once you get your crafting tint up to a certain level, you can start crafting what are called time capsules. This will allow you to reset a district and take a different path. You don't have to redo anything you've already done. Your character will just skip over them. So you don't have to do extra stuff by any means, but this gives you a means to get the things that you did not get previously and get some extra XP, circus fame, all that stuff. And then after you complete a district, special encounters will pop up called Kings of the District. This is a sort of special fight at the end of each district that offers a special encounter, more or less. Though, for the most part, these were pretty easy, to be honest. However, there are also clubs. Clubs are you fighting against 15 waves of enemies at a time for increasingly good rewards. Now, unlike everything else, the clubs don't kill your performers and they don't end the day. You basically just have free reign to try the clubs as much as you want. It's more of a combat challenge that doesn't affect the game too much. So pretty cool little addition there. Now, a big thing I wanted to talk about here, though, is that the last district of the game was just not a good time for me. I think it could use a balance pass because I ran through the game twice overall. And in both instances, the worst part of the game was the last district. As even on normal, the enemies at this point have out leveled you. And I did everything possible, cleared all the districts, etc. And that was actually the only way I could get by the last district was going back and doing everything else because just going there naturally following the story. The fifth district was a decent challenge, but, you know, it didn't feel too bad. And then you get to the last district and suddenly you're underleveled. So I had to double back, do all this time capsule stuff, do the kings of the district stuff to kind of level up and get back to where I needed to be. And even then the enemy team compositions get really annoying here combined with the fact that I couldn't get the crafting resources I needed to get the consumables I needed to deal with combat. Now, I can see people getting annoyed right here and just quitting, which I think is fair, but there is kind of ways around this. As I mentioned, you can replay districts through time capsules, and you can also take part in the training grounds at the circus tent. You can actually get small amounts of resources from doing the training grounds, so if you're persistent enough, you can get the resources to kind of just get past this, and chances are some people won't even run into the same issues, I'm sure, but like a lot of games, I did just notice a bit of a dip in the overall experience right at the end, which is a bummer, frankly, because that's right when the story starts picking up. And as I mentioned, the story is pretty interesting. So it was a bummer to kind of hit that roadblock of sorts right at the end, even if I did obviously get through it. But from there, let's talk positives, negatives, and ramp this thing up. So positives, overall, very polished game for an indie title. I have seen reports of people having things like crashes to desktop, that type of stuff. But personally, I didn't really experience any bugs at all, which is always nice. And again, just everything has a very high level of quality to it, which is worth mentioning when you're looking at an indie title. Moreover, I really enjoyed all of the options to build your party, all the classes, all the variety to the combat, all the various things you could do. There's a lot to play around with there and try out. I really enjoyed the devotion mechanic, again, and how it was kind of woven into other aspects of the game that would then affect the combat experience. I enjoyed that quite a bit. I also enjoyed the overall theme of the game. It's very well put together. But obviously there are some negatives that I've mentioned. Uh, again, the crafting and the random resource stuff was just overall kind of eh for me. I wish there was just a slightly more specific way to get resources I needed. I think that would have made progression a lot easier in quite a few places. And then again, broadly, just the last act 
of the game, that last district, was just a noticeable quality drop compared to everything else. And last but not least, this might just be more of a me thing, didn't care so much for the UI. I thought it was a little too busy. This is a UI that, you know, I kind of get what they were going for here, obviously with the circus themes, they wanted to make it kind of over the top, but I do think there's a lot of visual clutter associated with this UI, and that's just not my thing, honestly. But at the same time, that's one of those things I could see other people enjoying, so just kind of is what it is, I guess. But all of that, of course, brings us to our conclusion. Circus Electrique is $20 on Steam. I've heard some of the regional pricing has gone up and changed here in the last few days, so make of that what you will, but it's $20 US dollars, which I think is a fantastic price for this game, actually. What it's trying to do, it does very, very well. The turn-based combat is quite fun. Again, ton of variety to it. Story, pretty solid, even though I wasn't expecting that much from it. And all of it kind of culminates in a satisfying gameplay loop. Nonetheless, this is a sort of niche style game that I don't think is going to be for everyone, but I would tell you that if you are interested in this title, it is definitely worth $20. Definitely a buy from me overall. A lot of fun, very unique experience and sort of its theme and delivery. But there you guys go. My review after 100% for Circus Electric. Certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.